Hi, welcome. I hope you're taking care of yourself. If you're new here, my name is Lexi and I read a lot of books. I think about books. I talk about books. I buy books. I organize books. I put a book under my pillow for good luck every night. I don't actually do that. I have a little bit under 300 books logged on my Goodreads account, which is crazy by the way, because I first got back into reading a little bit over three years ago. And in that time, I've rated 53 books, five stars. That's not the number on my five star shelf. I've been doing the research. I've been doing the deep dive. I've been cross examining with my fancy notion spreadsheet. We do what we must to uphold a high standard of accuracy here at Newly Nova. So there's 53 books I've actually rated five stars. And if you're running the numbers, that's a little bit under one in every five books that I've read since like 2019 or so. And today I'm gonna be tier ranking all of these books that I've rated five stars to see which ones either A, hold up in my memory as like essential life altering, really, really wonderful reads, or alternatively, which ones have perhaps not aged as well in the few years since I've read them. We have six tiers today to put these five star reads into. The first one, the top tier, The Exalted, is I Will Never Shut Up About This. This is transcendent literature. These are better than six star books to me. They're my absolute favorites. I will go to the ends of the earth defending them forever. Their authors and me go to coffee every week. We're best friends. I send them Christmas cards. They send me page numbers that I can turn to if I want to cry and just lose connection with reality. That's what this tier is for. Next we have perfect book, no notes. This is pretty self-explanatory. These are the five star books that also have that kind of extra kick, that extra special something, the cherry on top, if you will. Then we have the simple to understand holds up, which are all valid five star books in my opinion, but haven't like stood the test of time as well as the other books in terms of being books that I return to, that I'm thinking about, that are memorable in some capacity beyond just being a five-star reading experience. Obviously, they're still really good. I gave them five stars. They're better than like 95% of the things that I recommend. Then we have I Was Being Nice, which are books that I probably would not have rated five stars in my modern era of being slightly more of a bitch. They definitely weren't bad and I like them for what they were, but I'm just pickier now, I think, and they don't have that like five-star feeling anymore. Next we have She Doesn't Even Go Here for books that I apparently have read but have absolutely no memories of reading. I could not tell you a single thing about the books here. So probably not real five-star reads if they didn't even really make a dent in my smooth brain, but also honestly not enough information to say. Finally, at the bottom, we have Sweet Summer Child, which is for books that I'm low-key a little bit ashamed <laughs> to have given five stars <laughs> for whatever reason. They're just not that good, and that was the old me, and we don't talk to her anymore. And yeah, we're just gonna like drag and drop and banter a little bit about each book as we do it. I'm not gonna be giving out plot summaries because we'd be here forever and neither of us want that. So there are also no spoilers. Really in this video, I only plan for there to be the loosiest, goosiest vibes. Also disclaimer, I will always love and respect these books for what they were to me when I read them. I will, but we're probably gonna be a little bit brutal here. And by that, I mean that I learned today that I've only given out eight five-star ratings, apparently, all, all of this year so far out of like 85 books. There are books that I love more than a lot of the other books on this list that I rated 4.5. That's what I mean when I say that I'm a little bit of a jaded bitch now. My bar has apparently just grown very tall and I, I don't know what happened to it. Things have changed. Let's see how those retro like 2019 and 2020 picks do <laughs> in this new field. <laughs> okay, let's get into this. We're just gonna, we're gonna launch A Man Called Uva. If you like the idea of reading about a sad, grumpy Swedish man, this book will do it to you. I have this like extremely vivid memory of sobbing in an airport during this really long flight delay on Christmas Eve because of this book, which is criminal behavior. I will be the first to admit and I would be remiss not to give this book credit where credit is due. I would say this one holds up. I don't think about it all of the time, but it still gives that five-star feeling whenever I am reminded of its existence. Actor Age Eve Brown. This is the third book in the Brown Sisters trilogy, and it's the only one, by the way, that I rated five stars. And it's kind of this like disgruntled mutual dislike to being forced to work together on a project to unlikely friends to lovers situation, which is just a really fun chain of events. It's just really good. And the banter is fire and the story is cute. And it's the perfect book, in my opinion, for what it is. Like if there was a romance book, Mount Rushmore, this would be on mine for sure. Babel. If you're following along at home, I just read this like mere moments ago. So obviously it's still a five star read for me. Like that should go without saying. My opinion has not changed in the week and a half since I finished this. Because of Babel, there is now footage out in the internet, out in the world of me crying like an infant child in a chair hugging a squishmallow. So credit where credit is due. Once again, this destroyed me. I'm not sure yet if this is quite in the top tier for me. I think I need more time to see how it sits in my memory and how often I feel the need to revisit it and think about it. For now, it is an easy six star perfect book. No notes. I thought it was fantastic. And if the premise sounds like anything that is even kind of compelling to you, I think that you're really going to enjoy it. Bad Blood. So this is a business nonfiction book about the Elizabeth Holmes Theranos corporate fraud scandal. I read this so on a whim. This is not typically my purview. I was kind of just feeling chaotic. And it is actually wild to me that situations like this can even happen in real life. If you've never heard about this scandal before, this woman girl bossed her way into running one of the most influential health corporations in America. She's filthy 
rich. She's incredibly influential. Time Magazine profiles abound, and never once did the technology at the core of her company actually work. It was all a lie, like the entire time. She lied to the public, she lied to her investors, she lied to literally everybody who works there, and like fired and disappeared the people who she didn't like, which is insane. Like the whole situation is just insane. With that said, I think that it's pretty likely that I overrated this book a little bit, honestly, because of how bonkers the situation is. It's five star drama, it's tea, but as a book, I think that it's probably more of a 4.5 or a 4 based on how much I remember enjoying the actual reading experience. So yeah, rating this as the woman that I am today, this goes into the I was being nice here. Betty, uh, I have not felt peace since I finished this book. It's still my favorite book from this year, and yeah, I'll never shut up about this. This is the easiest placement of my life. I've already talked about it a million times. It's such a heartbreaking story. Like, it has essentially every trigger warning in it, all of them, just sauced in there, but it's just told with so much light and compassion. Like, I've never seen an author do it quite like that before. She's something special. Genuinely one of my favorite books I've ever read in my entire life. It's just really good. Book lovers. I love the representation for ambitious, detail-oriented, mean bitches in this book. I really felt seen here. Charlie is peak fictional man for me. I loved the vibes. I loved the sisterhood dynamic. For me, this is easily Emily Henry's best book, and that's coming from a pretty big fan of her overall. This is just great. It's not quite top tier for me, but it's close. Crying in H Mart. Um, this memoir ruined me. I was a mess. Can you tell already, you know, seven books in or whatever, that there are only two reasons that I'll ever give the book five stars, either because it A, turned me into a shallow puddle of water on my bedroom floor, or alternatively was like, hee hee haha, -ha, kicking my feet in the air, kind of fun. Those are the only reasons apparently a book will end up here. But I love Michelle Zahner, aka Japanese Breakfast, aka an absolute idol goddess. I think that she's a baddie. I think that she's wonderful. I think that she's an exceptional writer. And it was just all of the feelings, it was all of the emotion. That's the thing about memoirs. Like when they hit, they hit. And this one was a mortal wound, even though it doesn't quite hit the top tier for me. I think that this is where it belongs for sure. This is Displacement, which is a graphic novel about, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, a biracial girl who accidentally travels back in time and kind of like body swaps into her Japanese grandmother's personal history, who was put into a Japanese internment camp. The art in the story is just absolutely beautiful. Like I'll throw up a few images just to sparkle them on you a little bit. And it's just a really poignant examination of feeling out of touch with the things that made your family who they are, as well as reckoning with extreme generational injustice. I would put this in the holds up tier, educated. The top of the list has actually been really good so far because this to me is the perfect life story memoir. First of all, what Tara goes through in this book is insane, truly ridiculous that there are children in this country, like not very far away probably from where you are right now that have childhoods like this. It's bonkers to me what she's been able to survive, but in this book, the way that she captures this complicated relationship that she has with her love for her family that is still there, despite all of the bad things that have happened to her, is just Ah, it breaks your spirit while also simultaneously healing you and like ascending you to a different place. It it's just really good. It's for sure in my top tier. That's why I've already put it there. I think about this book constantly. Like what I always say is that it's inspiring in the way that only a book that is not trying to be anything, it's not trying to be inspiring. It's not trying to change your life. Only a book like that could do what this book does to me. It's always in my brain. It never leaves. Firekeeper's Daughter. This is a young adult thriller about everything that surrounds an investigation of a murder that happens at a reservation. I went into this book truly with no expectations and I came out like gagged. I'm pretty sure that it's almost 500 pages if I I recall correctly, like it's pretty long, especially for a young adult book, but I think I read almost all of it in a day. I was so invested in Donis's story that I canceled my plans, <laughs> which like low key, I'm always looking for an excuse to cancel my plans. But this book also just gave me no choice. Like it was twisty, it was turny, it was really, really good. It had me wired up until I finished it. I would definitely put this in holds up. It's for sure a five star read for me. The hating game. Okay, so this has been kind of top heavy so far, but we're finally getting into the books that low key, I'm a little bit ashamed to have liked as much as I did. I think this was my first romance novel for adults ever. And as somebody who grew up with the Hallmark Channel on loop constantly in the background of every room I was ever in in my entire life because of my mother, it reminded me strongly of actually good rom-coms, which is ironic because it was made into a truly terrible rom-com. But I love this when I read it. I remember thinking that it was the shit. Looking back, there are things that are just kind of weird in this book. Low key, the love interest is kind of creepy and possessive, which I remember loving at the time. Time, and the endless desire to make the main character like as quirky as it was possible for a tiny little woman to be. It's a little 
little cringe looking back. Like I would honestly put this into my sweet summer child tier. I, I, I think that that's where it belongs. I don't see a world where it's above a three or a four for me. I'm no longer the apologist that I once was for this book, but I still liked it for what it was. I just, I don't know, man. That was a different time for me. I had not yet seen the world. I had not yet seen the things that this bountiful green earth has to offer the girls. You can't judge me for my first dip in the ocean, you know? Heartstopper. Okay, so all of the books in the Heartstopper series, I've given five stars. I just have the first one here kind of as a placeholder. I'm nothing if not like every other person who has ever read the series before because I think it's fantastic. I think it's show-stopping. I really wish it existed for me when I was like 15 or 16 because given how much I love them now as a 23 year old woman, I can't imagine how I would have felt in the target audience. This is going to sound dramatic, but I am dramatic. I actually think that maybe reading this earlier than I did would have changed the trajectory of my life in a not insignificant way. I just love it. It's a peak queer coming of age story if you're looking for one. I think it misses out on my top tier by just like a hair of what I can't tell you. It's all vibes, but I would never put it lower than perfect book, no notes, because that is exactly what it is. It's a perfect book. Her body and other parties. Ooh, okay. So I love this author, Carmen Maria Machado. I love her mostly for another book on this list, which I think I read actually after this one. So I feel bad deflating my rating for her body and other parties. But to be honest with you, I think it belongs in I Was Being Nice. This is a short story collection, which notoriously it's very difficult to get me to rate a short story collection five stars because inherently, if you have a couple of stories that are a little bit weaker than the rest of the collection, I'm like, well, the consistency, which I understand is kind of a fake critique to have. I wasn't always like this until I learned through another book on this list that you can have a short story collection where every single story is an absolute banger. They're all good. They all hit. That to me became my new standard for five stars in the genre. And looking back, Her Body and Other Parties has stories that are phenomenal. The Husband Stitch, banger. I still think about that story pretty regularly. Unpopular opinion, but one of my other favorites from that collection was actually the one where Carmen just took every single episode of Law & Order SVU and wrote these like weird short story fictionalized anecdotes that very, very loosely maybe follow the overarching plot of the series, but are a lot more horror-based and atmospheric and tell this completely different, obviously overarching story that kind of makes no sense. And it's really long and kind of convoluted. And I remember a lot of people online having beef with that story specifically. I actually really love that one. That's one that I still think about as well. But there are other things in the collection that just didn't hit the same. And as a complete set, I think I would give it more of a 4.5 if I were rating it today in my spoilers post office of historical corrections world as my post office of historical corrections self. Homegoing. This one's tough because I actually remember when I was rating this initially thinking pretty intensely about whether to give it 4.5 or 5 stars. But I ended up giving it a 5 because I felt like the overall thing that the book tried to accomplish in being a family saga that followed these two different tracks of the family line after they divided at some crucial point like 250 300 years ago in history the things that accomplished with that structure were really impressive and i was willing to forgive like parts of the story that struck me as slightly less strong although i still enjoyed reading the entire book because i thought that the overarching structure what was just really cool and not something I've read before in, in that way just a really unique book and yeah i mean the more i talk about it the more i'm like this holds up i've convinced myself <laughs> It's just, it's just a good book. I'll Be Gone in the Dark. This was also one of the first books that I read when I was getting back into reading many, many moons ago. And I do not remember a single thing about this book other than basically that it's about the Golden State Killer, A, and B, that the author, Michelle McNamara, famously died as she was completing the book. So the last like third or so, I think, is written by a different author that she was really close with, utilizing her notes. Oh, and also subnote C, to add to the tragedy, that two years, I think, after the author died and the book was published, maybe three years, I don't know the timeline. Don't ask me for facts that make sense or are true. I will not provide them to you. The Golden State Killer was actually caught using DNA very soon after this book was published and Michelle McNamara died. So she never actually got to see the case that she spent so many years of her life fixated on and researching come to a conclusion, which is really sad. But that's all I got. I, I think I liked this book because it felt more victim centered. Couldn't tell you a single specific example of why or how. Couldn't tell you anything actually other than what I've already told you. So she doesn't even go here. I don't know anything about it. I would have to reread it to give you an opinion. But I lent my copy to one of my friends three years ago and now she lives in New York. So 
that's that. I'm glad my mom died. If you were an iCarly fan and or you ever spent way too much time on Twitter, like digging through celebrity drama, this is a book that you will very, very, very much like. This one for me definitely holds off. I finished it actually on my birthday last year. I remember reading it that afternoon, like on my bed, losing my mind. This is a star from a show that was a very important part of my girlhood, my childhood. And her story captures very well a lot of the just truly despicable things that we make children do in Hollywood for entertainment. So if that sounds interesting to you, I think that you too would find that it holds up, but that is where it belongs for me. In the Dream House. So this is the other Carmen Maria Machado book that I mentioned, and I absolutely was feral over this book. I talk about it to anybody basically who will listen to me, who even expresses like the barest, tiniest sliver of interest in memoirs, because this to me is a masterclass in pushing the boundaries of form and how you tell a story, even when it's completely true to your life. It definitely goes up here. I will never shut up about it. The entire book is just these really short chapters that are all tropes or metaphors or things that are in some way related to the concept of haunted houses and haunted things and spooky scaries. And she uses all of these familiar things to tell the story of an abusive relationship that she had with her ex-girlfriend that ultimately led to her meeting, falling in love with, and marrying her wife. And it's just so good. Like, I feel like this ruined other books for me when I read it. Into Thin Air. Okay, so this is a book that I also remember reading pretty early in my reading journey, but I very, very much still talk about and think about this all of the time. So you have John Krakauer, right, who at the time was one of the biggest journalists on, I think, Outside Magazine, one of those outdoorsy type things. And he sent on assignment to climb Mount Everest and write about the experience for the magazine. And the expedition that he just ends up happening to be assigned to ends up being one of the three expeditions that was involved in the greatest disaster in the history of climbing Mount Everest in terms of casualties. I do not remember even for a second how many people died, but it was a lot. It was a massive amount of people. It was incredibly dangerous. And the things that those people did on that mountain to survive will blow your mind. What an insane thing that a legitimately exceptional writer just so happened to be on an expedition that ended this horrifically. Obviously I feel bad for him because trauma, but like the book that we got out of it is so good. It almost reads like a thriller. Like you really get to know all of the different characters on the exposition. I love this. I remember thinking it was absolutely insane. I still think about it all the time. I think that it probably belongs here. Perfect book, no notes, know my name. Okay, I don't have anything to say about this other than if you haven't read this book by now, you absolutely should. I've seen it before and I'll say it again. This is my pick, I think, for modern day required reading for everybody on this planet, especially in terms of gendered violence, because that's what it is. It's a memoir by Chanel Miller about her experiences as the survivor in the very infamous Stanford essay case that happened. And the only people that I think should avoid it are people who know that they would not be able to handle the subject matter. Everybody else, even if it's like a challenge, but you think you might be able to do it, you should read it because it's just a very important story of injustice and cruelty, but also ultimately like recovery and light and I'm getting emotional if I talk about it anymore but you should definitely read it. Last Night at the Telegraph Club. Okay, I feel bad saying this about this book because I remember vaguely that this was really really good but could I tell you a single thing about the plot of this book. No, I couldn't name a single character other than just the vibes of it being a young adult historical fiction sapphic coming of age story. It stopped existing in my brain, which is a shame because I remember really liking it. I think that there's a decent chance that if I did reread it, it would do decently well on this list, but I can't confidently put it anywhere because I don't even remember what happens in the story. It like completely washed away from my brain. She doesn't even go here. Legend born. Ah, I love this book. It's going straight to the top. If you know me at all, you know that this is always the book that I use as my barometer for why I still read YA fantasy. It's just a really good book. It's what I recommend to anybody who's checked out of YA thinking that they're no longer ever going to be the target audience for anything in the genre. This is why sometimes YA can still be worth reading, in my opinion, for stories like that. It's just awesome. Likewise, Bloodmark, the sequel, I think goes into the second tier. Perfect book, no notes. I still loved it. I was still feral over it. I'm still mad that I can't continue to read the series because those are the only two books out. But the overarching narrative arc of the original Legendborn and the genuine shock and awe that I felt at the end of that book completely propels it into the top tier for me in a way that Bloodmark's just, because I already knew a lot of the really interesting twists, did not quite do in the same way. Malibu Rising. This is another book that I've read. I feel like mostly I gave this five stars because it was just a good contemporary book. It was fast paced. It had me thinking thoughts. It had me going, ooh, you guys should be together. Ooh, you guys are getting a divorce. Ooh, trouble in paradise. What's it gonna mean? But also that doesn't sound like me because describing it to you right now, I would give that book four stars. I give almost every contemporary book that I think is a good time, good drama, fun, 
four stars. That's the rating that I typically give that description. And because I can't tell you why this was a five star book, she doesn't even go here. I don't remember why I loved it. I didn't even read this that long ago, but thinking about it now, there's not even one thing where I'm like, this was phenomenal, this was fantastic. And I feel like I just must be forgetting something. And I'm not ashamed of liking this book. I just don't know why it's on this list. And yet it is. Maybe you should talk to someone. Fun fact, I actually recorded me giving this book as a recommendation in my recent Specific Rex video, but I lost half the audio for the recording, so I didn't make the final cut, which was really sad because this is a book that I really loved. It was also one of the books that I read when I was first getting back into reading, but it's a memoir about a therapist and her work with her clients, but also her experience ultimately getting therapy herself. Looking back, I'm honestly not sure ethically whether it was something that should be out in the world. You know, like HIPAA, who knows her? I'm sure she got permission from everybody before she wrote them into her book, but I loved it. I also thought the writing was good. I definitely cried reading this. I don't know, it's been years. I'm sure that if I revisited it, I would also cry reading this now. Belongs here for sure. My Dark Vanessa. One thing about me is that I love this book more than I love almost any other book that's even within this tier. I think that it might be my favorite so far of the books up here. I don't know what that says about me. I don't know what you're thinking about me. <laughs> based on that, but at the time that I read this book, it was the most emotional I think that I've ever been, at least in my adult life, over a piece of media. Definitely will not work for everybody, but it's one of those books where it's like, if you don't like it, I don't even want to know. I don't even want you to tell me. I did not ask for your opinion. I need to live in a world where I can think of this book as the perfect thing that I remember it to be. If you want to be torn apart, if you want to not have a soul anymore, if you want to not be the same person that you were before you opened the dark black and white book with the butterfly on the cover, you'll love it. You're going to have a great time, you're gonna have a wonderful experience. I love being destroyed by the books that I read. It's like one of my favorite things. If a book can make me feel that way and like feel that much emotion, it's always going to be like skyrocketed to the top of my list. I mean, I cried actually every single book that's in this top six here. I, I, <laughs> they were all their own mental breakdown. So take that as you will. Oh man, with that, I didn't even realize what was next, but Not That Bad is an anthology that was put together by Roxane Gay, who is one of my all time role models. Like I'm obsessed with that woman. If you know anything about me, you know that. And this is another book that's in the top tier. Oh man, it's just so good. Like, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but have you guys ever seen a group of women either in the wild, out in the world, but I find that for me, it's normally in movies or TV or something where like they have a particular kind of look in their eyes and just you see them and the weight of the world just hits you and you start crying because like there's a group of women and they're all living and so am I. Like I too am living. Maybe it's just me, but if you've ever had that feeling before, I think that you'd really love this anthology like I did because it's that feeling but like as a book of just profound sadness and empathy for the experiences that I think everybody in this book is either a woman or a non-binary person, but all sorts of violence that people experience like in this world. I don't know. It hit, it hit, it hit. It's really good. Oh, it's just a really good book. One to watch. <laughs> this is a romance novel that's basically what if The Bachelor had a plus sized lead. I read this at like the peak of my reality TV hyperfixation. This was an era of my life where I was binging like every single season of Survivor during one semester of college. That's what I was doing. And I was also watching The Bachelor every week with my friends, not trying to flex, but I designed an entire rule set and draft for a fantasy bachelor league. <laughs> Did not win. My drafting that season was poor. The girl who won actually was named Rose, which felt fitting. But that's like the kind of headspace that I was in when I read this book. And looking back, Sweet Summer Child, like, what did this book even... <laughs> <laughs> what was even going on? I liked what it did with plus size rep. That was pretty cool. But other than that, the actual story, like this is not a five star book. I don't know why I thought it was a five star book. Other than that, it was like exactly the kind of juice and dopamine that my brain needed to survive during that era of my life. I was literally watching Survivor every single meal. It was who I was at the time. And I still love Survivor for the record, but I definitely do not think I would be giving this book five stars in the modern era. You know, it was exactly what it was. <laughs> Part of your world. Looking at this now, I think I gave this book 4.5 stars. I read this this year. I think I messed up. I think I messed up the list. It's kind of hard because on Goodreads, you can't give half stars and like sometimes I'll round up, sometimes I'll round down. I have no consistency. I just 
do what feels right in the moment. So I tried to cross check everything against my notion, but I'm pretty confident that this was not actually a five star book. So I'm just going to put it in to I was being nice because if it was a five star book, it probably shouldn't be. I say that with love. Like obviously I still really enjoyed this. 4.5 stars is a really high rating for me. I loved the main couple. I loved the dynamic that they had throughout the book, but I recall this book having the nonsense that sometimes romance novels have where it's just 50 to 70 pages of the characters writhing in agony with the same thought patterns every single time around why they can't have the other person. In this book, it was just them saying over and over again, it'll never work out. He's from a small town. I'm from the big city. He'll never be a part of my world. This book could have been 60 pages shorter. And if it was, it probably would be a five star read. But I eye rolled like a little bit too many times during <laughs> those sections of the book to give it like an unvarnished rating. People we meet on vacation. Now this is going to be a hot take because before I read Book Lovers, this was definitely my favorite Emily Henry book. It single-handedly proved to me that Friends to Lovers was a trope that was worthy occasionally of rights. I found the central conflict and the way that it kind of evolved over the course of six or seven, I think, different summers of these two characters getting to know each other through going on vacation together. It was just really fun. It was a really good time. I really related to some of the personality conflicts that both of the characters were kind of facing within themselves. But looking back, even then, there were things in the book that I thought were kind of overwhelming. And the central crux of the book felt like it relied a little bit too much on the miscommunication trope, which is not something I like to see for my main conflict. And if I'm being real and true and vulnerable, I don't think I would give it five stars if I read it again. I think that it would sit really here in the 4.5 star tier. Golden Sun and Morning Star, I'm going to talk about together. The original Red Rising is not on this list. That was a 4.5 book for me, but I thought that the rest of the series clutched it up dude it was so good i've never felt more testosterone in my body than i did reading this series to me at least right now these definitely belong in the perfect book no notes tier right now those two books especially golden sun to be honest with you easily the best science fiction that i've read which for the record i have not read very much science fiction but those are the ones i like the most for now ask me again in another three years and we'll see how that changes red white and royal blue this is as close to fan fiction i think as you can get in the modern world. Reading this book took me straight back to the person I was on Tumblr in eighth grade. And as someone who is fueled by nostalgia more than I am anything else, that is almost the highest praise that I can give a book. I would put this staunchly as well in the perfect book, No Notes Tier. There are things in this book that are objectively stupid or make no sense. I mean, politically, there's a lot going on considering the fact that it's a romance between the crown prince or second prince, I don't remember, of England, and then also the first son of America. The book feels compelled to do political things, which is what it is. It's a romance novel. And the actual romance in the found family of the supporting cast of characters is just so good. It's so much fun. Heavy fanfiction energy reminded me so strongly of who I used to be, which is a feeling I always chase in fiction. Seven Days in June, there she is. That's my favorite romance novel. That's going straight to the top tier. I've never laughed more at a romance novel, first of all, which is normally hard to do. Most of the time I find myself going kind of like, I don't even know if you can hear me, but I'm blowing air out of my nose. But this book got like a couple of, <laughs> you know, actual <laughs> <laughs> chuckles out of me, which is rare, but it's also not a rom-com. Like there's so much drama in this book. There's so much meat. There's so much tension between the characters, the shared history that they have. This is a second chance romance. I'm not describing it well to you because I don't care. I'm giving you the vibes. I'm giving you the inside of my brain when I think about this book, but the historical tension between these characters is just so much in the way that they grow and change and end up authors who are writing to each other across space and time and also genre of their books. I ate it up. If that's not love, I don't know what is. Like this to me is peak so far of anything I've ever read in the romance genre. I am obsessed with it. I love it very, very much. It is my favorite. It's my favorite one. Moving on, Six of Crows. This is another like good section of this list. Maybe I just have always had good taste. I can't not put Six of Crows in perfect book no notes. The found family vibes, immaculate. The characterization, really, really good. The heist plot, I love theft. And that's what this is. Everybody's a criminal. They all do morally great things and have tragic backstories. And then things go sideways for them. Like name a better skeleton for a book. You can't. Crooked Kingdom as well goes in perfect book, no notes. I liked it, I think, even more than Six of Crows. It definitely made me cry. I recall regretting strongly that I waited this long to read the series. And also that I thought it would be bad, kind of. If you don't like the original Shadow and Bone trilogy, there's still hope for you. Because to me, it was like they were written by different authors in terms of how much I enjoyed them. Shadow and Bone was deeply mid, if not bad sometimes in the later books, but Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, 
bangers all gas those books they're just really good and the last young adult book i think on this list that i've given five stars is the wicked king which is the second book in the cruel prince trilogy i think i gave the first book 4.5 and the third book a four i read this series like three years ago at this point so it's been a while but i recently had my best friend read these and she confirms what i already knew which is that jude the protagonist of this series is one of the most feral people i've ever read a fantasy novel about i'm obsessed with her she's psychotic <laughs> like actually a crazy person in the name of getting what she wants. I'm obsessed with her. I want to be her. I love her romance with Cardin because they're both awful to each other. Like it's not one-sided. I don't like bully romances where it's just one person bullying somebody and then that person's life gets ruined for no reason, but they're like, I love you anyways. That does not work for me. I find that disgusting. But Jude and Cardin are evil, both of them, all of the time to each other. And that works. This was far from the first book that I read when I was first getting back into reading, but this was the trilogy that started me reading as much as I do now. After I read the entire Entire Cruel Prince trilogy in like a day and a half, which was just a bleary haze for me in my past. I was packing 10 to 12 books a month forever because it made me love reading permanently. So in honor of that, it holds up. That's where it belongs. I love it. It's a clear five star. Okay, so next is The Obelisk Gate and also The Stone Sky. I'll do those together too, which are books two and three in the fifth season trilogy. I think I gave the first one in this trilogy also a 4.5, even though honestly the first book is the one that I think about by far the most often. I think that what it did narratively, if you know you know, is just insane like what how would you come up with that how would you write that I, I just i lost my mind reading it so in spirit if anything that book has like upgraded in my memory to being five stars but easily this as well like these two books belong in perfect book no notes for me i just love the world that this trilogy created it's this grim dark geology major climate change post-apocalyptic fantasy and it does all of those things perfectly in my opinion no notes like you think when you're reading it that it's not just going to continuously rend your heart over and over and over again and then it does and you're like well, and it makes me emotional, like even thinking about what happens to the characters. The Hard Principle, okay. This is another book where I think I probably inflated my rating, which it's a more recent read, so you wouldn't expect that from me in the current era. But I remember when I was reading it, I hadn't read a romance novel recently, and I also hadn't read a contemporary fiction, kind of like tearjerker novel recently. And this book just does both of those things. Like that's kind of the entire idea is it's half romance novel and then half a story about this girl who's dealing with this incredibly complicated situation with her family where she ends up having to take care of her dad and it puts a lot of emotional stress on her and her sister and her mother and I don't know what it was I don't know what was in the air at the time but both parts of the stories just like really hit for me I think this book made me cry and normally when something properly makes me cry it always gets five stars almost regardless of whatever else is going on but looking back with a little bit more distance I think that it does both the romance and the contemporary parts less effectively than it would have done either of them on their own if that makes sense like specifically I remember this book having an incredibly rushed ending I think if I were to read it again today I would probably have given it a 4 or 4.5 probably a 4.5 like I think it was really good but it just doesn't have that five star feeling of complete experience I think that a lot of these other books do. The Last Olympian, retro pick from when I reread the entire Percy Jackson series my sophomore year of college. I'm gonna keep this brief. I think I was being nice. Percy Jackson as a concept and as a completed series, and also very specifically as something that I read when I was exactly the target audience in middle school and then reread like three more times throughout my life. Five stars, six stars, 10 stars. It's perfect. I see no flaws. But with that said, and it feels bad to critique this because it's literally middle grade. Like I'm so far away from this being relevant to me anymore. But for the way that the story handled Luke and Annabeth alone. <laughs> this can't be five stars. This cannot be five stars. She was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I'm gonna say about that. I hope you understand. I hope you know how much I'm looking forward to the Disney Plus series. I will be tuning in. I will be there. The Midnight Library. This is interesting because, and I talked a little bit about this before. In the time since I read this book, I've read a lot of critiques of it that I totally get. I totally understand. I can see why this book would not work for everybody. I can see why people would think that it's a little bit shallow or find the writing to be cliche or whatever, but I can't not put this in holds up. I guarantee you, if I were to read this book again, I would give it five stars. I would be a emotional about the fact that I read this book at such a low point in my life and be very thankful that I did and that it did work for me and that the things that bothered other people did not really impact me the same way. It's one of those things where everybody's going to have their own opinion, but it will always be a very special book for me for what it was. The Night Circus. I still have never read another book like this. And 
that includes, by the way, The Starless Sea, which is Aaron Morgenstern's other book. It just didn't hit the same. And I don't know, it was still beautiful, but it kind of felt like an Uncanny Valley version of this book because the experience that I had reading this was so, so immersive compared to anything else that I've ever read in my entire life. I actually felt like I was there. I went on Etsy and I bought merch. <laughs> almost immediately after finishing this book because of how sad I was that I wouldn't just be able to like exist in that world anymore. It's just such a unique story. The only thing that I can think of that comes close to how this book made me feel and the book that I always recommend when people ask me for similar things is Piranesi, but even that did not hit the same. Like you'll notice that is not on this list for me, despite the fact that it is a book that I enjoy. The sense of wonder that the Night Circus cultivates, I think single-handedly means it holds up. There are still problems with the book, like hyperbole, hyperbole, of course it has a plot, of course it has characters, but those parts of the book are just quite weak in comparison. And they only end up hitting because of how whimsically the setting of this book just like takes you in and entices you like a little care. Come and spend the day in the night circus, you know? Like that's the only reason why the plot and characters of this book are compelling because in a vacuum, like they're easily the weakest part of the story. Which means this book is quite special for me because normally if something is too descriptive or too literary, like I don't like it. I strongly prefer books that have strong characters, strong voice, strong plot. Those are typically the things that I value most in literature. I mean, it's probably why a lot of these books up here are memoirs because it's literally a person writing about their life. Like they're going to have strong voice, strong characters, strong plot. But The Night Circus has none of those things and is still like one of the easiest five stars I've ever given a book. The Office of Historical Corrections. I love this book. I've talked about it before. I'll talk about it again because I never see anybody else talk about this book on social media for no reason other than in my brain just because short stories are not a genre that you really see very often online. But this book is something so special. Like the range of emotions that I felt reading it, it's just so good. I still think about the title novella, which is like maybe the last third of the book in length, constantly when I'm reading the news, like almost all of the time. It's like become a lens through which I look at the world, which is one of the highest pieces of praise that I can give. All of the short stories are gas in my opinion. There is nary a dud in the bunch. They're all phenomenal. And if you haven't read it by now and you subscribe to me, I'm just wondering like what you're doing. You should get on that, the Poppy War Trilogy. I'm torn because a part of me is like, I will never shut up about these books. This is also one of my like real life most recommended books to friends. I've made a couple of my friends read this by now. They've all loved it because I only recommend books to people with taste. I think though it probably belongs in perfect book, no notes, like the entire trilogy does. They all they all move there. The main character of this trilogy, Rin, is one of the most like sympathetic anti-heroes slash kind of villains that I've ever read about in anything. And her arc through these books is just, insane it's so good and yeah i just love it recommend it to everybody strongly good great series seven husbands of evelyn hugo this is a book talk favorite like an absolute darling of the app and it along with actually the song of achilles which i'm going to be talking about next apparently is one of the few books that are like book talk royalty that honestly i feel like deserve their place where they are. At least in terms of my enjoyment, I could not put this book down. It was glued to my hands the entire time that I was reading it. And the same has been true for everybody in real life that I've recommended this to. It's compulsively readable. The character Evelyn Hugo's voice is just really sarcastic and strong and interesting. I almost never recommend this book because I've heard of some mixed messages regarding representation and whether or not it was effective and good, especially I think with Monica's character, who is this journalist that's helping Evelyn Hugo to write her biography. There's a lot of debates in the community about that. And I recommend looking into them if you're concerned. But as a book, I remember really liking this. I think if I were to reread it, it would hold up in my memory. The Song of Achilles. I have no idea why this blew up on Book Talk. It like makes no sense to me. Like this is not at all the kind of book that I would expect to do that well on that platform. It's really slow. It's incredibly descriptive. It's a retelling, sure, but of the fucking Iliad, which I doubt is anything that anybody on Book Talk has read. I know I have not, so it's not like I'm preaching to you or anything. But for some reason, this is the book that people decided to go absolutely feral over. And I'm really glad that people did because I might never have picked it up if not for how popular it was online. And I'm really glad that I did. I thought that this story was unbelievably beautiful. I was crying, screaming, throwing up. It was the first book that I read the year that I read it. And I was like, well, I peaked. Even just thinking about the ending is gonna make me tear up. I can't, I need to, I need to finish this video. Oh, okay. <laughs> the storied life of AJ Fickery. 
let's swap this a little bit. Let's do tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow first because we all know that's going in my top tier. I will never shut up about this book. I will be this book's number one fan forever until the end times. If I could inject that book into my veins every single day of my life, it would be better. It would improve. God, it's just, oh, the things that made me feel. The storytelling, the characters, the way that they weave in and out of each other's lives, all of the different kinds of love and relationships that you can have with people, and the way that the book just takes your like still beating heart out of your chest and says, ha ha ha, <laughs> it's just really good a really special experience my favorite book of all time I hope to God that I ever feel that way again and I hope that every single one of you watching this video reads the book anyways on that note Gabrielle Zevin also wrote the storied life of AJ Fickery which I read looking to feel like I did reading tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and I definitely think I inflated my reading of this book just because the writing style and the quirkiness aspect was kind of similar to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow it's still a really good book I still really enjoyed it I think that anybody who likes her other work will also have a good time reading it but like zero percent of it has stuck with me in the same way that tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow has which is an incredibly unfair bar but I also think that like it belongs among these other books as maybe in the moment when I was clicking my Goodreads star rating it was five stars but like two weeks afterwards it's like okay that was a four that was a 4.5 whatever and it's still really good but like all of the emotional questions and feelings and experiences that this book tries to make you have tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow just perfects and that's just how it is this white box down here is the David Foster Wallace commencement speech called this is water I now have it in book form I did not always it was given to me as a gift because famously if you know me well you know that this is a piece of media that had a really large impact on me and the way that I interact with the world and with my friends and the people that I love asterisk caveat this is not an endorsement of David Foster Wallace as a person and also obviously if you know the lore it's like very sad how antithetical what happened in his life is to what this speech kind of tries to put out into the world but yeah I mean it would be very reductive for me to say that this was anything other than a holds up given the fact that I revisit it constantly all of the time it's not perfect I found things in the time since that better capture the relationship that I want to have with the world than this does but this was maybe the first thing that I would always go back to whenever I needed a reminder that it was important and essential to be kind tonal shift but next we have Verity which <laughs> is going straight into the sweet summer child tier. Man, you know, I think about this sometimes. If you've been here since the beginning, my first ever viral video on TikTok was a video about Verity by Colleen Hoover. I don't have a defense for giving this book five stars other than I feel like the emotions it made me feel were just really intense and I had no other outlet other than to rate it five stars there was nothing else I could have done my hands were tied it's a thriller obviously and it's one of those thrillers where it feels like the author is asking herself over and over again like what is the craziest shit that could possibly happen in this moment what is the dumbest thing that this character could possibly do what is the zaniest way that this situation could continue to complicate itself just over and over again until it's just crazier and crazier and you're like how did I end up here what's going on that an experience I'd never had in the book before I read Verity this was one of my first real thrillers back during the summer when I was first getting back into reading and reading The Cruel Prince and rating The Hating Game five stars this was this was that same summer and the only thing I can say to defend myself is the book felt self-aware that all of the characters in the book were terrible people the romance in this book was clearly unacceptable and terrible and mostly included for shock value at least to me when I first read it that felt like what was happening but then I went on in the years following that to read a couple of other books by Colleen Hoover one of which is probably my least favorite book of all time I'll talk about this another day we don't need to get into it but reading Colleen Hoover's straight up romance books that were not blanketed under this atmosphere of being a thriller where just crazy shit happens I realized that most of this woman's books are not actually self-aware about how bad these characters are and most of the people picking up these books are like 16 year old girls who read November 9 and think that Ben from that book is like the blueprint they talk about him like he's a book boyfriend and a lot of the Colleen Hoover men are like that where to me it feels like they're no better than the characters in Verity who were obviously bad people and treated by the narrative as bad people except in those books they're being treated as good people so I don't know what I would give this book if I were to read it again but my thoughts on the author have like complicated my entire relationship with her catalog so much that in my head now it's almost a one-star book which can't be true because I liked it <laughs> like that must be false but I look back on it and I'm like these are my roots 2020 was a different time for me I was in the middle of quarantine you cannot hold me responsible for the opinions I had on romance thrillers in that era next up we have one that makes me kind of sad and that is we should all be feminists which 
is this really short, I think it was once a TED talk, but like This Is Water, it was adapted into this really like tiny book. It's maybe 40 or 50 pages. It can't be longer than that. At the time of reading it, I was like, Slay, everybody should read this. This is really good. This is why feminism is important in the modern world, but in a very succinct and approachable format. And then I found out that the author is a TERF. What do you do with that, you know? So I no longer display this book, I no longer talk about this book, and I spend all my days living in terror that I'm going to learn something new about somebody else that I love that will make me not support them anymore. And like the book I liked, it's called We Should All Be Feminists in She's a Turf. At the end of the day, I feel like it's not hard to be an accepting person and not use your public platform to make statements that are hateful, you know? At the end of the day, it just feels like something that is easy, actually, the easiest thing in the world. And yet I feel like so many celebrities just exist to disappoint me. So anyways, ending off with Yellow Face, which is R.F. Kuang's fifth book. Her other four books are all in perfect book, no notes. You might think this is going there. It's not, it's going in I Was Being Nice. I actually love this book. I would give it a 4.5, but I read or heard a take somewhere in the past six months. Nobody knows when, but it's in my brain now that I really agree with, which is that I think this book could have been shorter. There are things in the book that are just not super necessary to presenting the theming effectively as the author intended. Because at the end of the day, this is a book where the plot and the characters take a complete backseat to the message and the industry drama and nonsense and absolute injustice within publishing is, is pushed to the forefront of the book. Like that's what this book is about. And the characters are really only important insofar as they are ways to voice the different aspects of this completely fucked up web within publishing and how it impacts people of color, which is fascinating. I love reading this book. I think about it all the time, especially when there's publishing world drama that's going on. But at the end of the day, as a book, apart from what it's describing, I think that it's probably the weakest in Rebecca's catalog, which is still a book that's better than 90% of the things that I've ever read, but probably a four or five in the modern era if I were rating it today with like the discourse in my head about it that I've heard in the time since. And yeah, that's the list. We made it, we're done. Honestly, I thought this would turn out to be more of a standard distribution kind of thing going on, like less in the top and more in the middle and then also more at the bottom. But you know what? I'm honestly pretty glad that it didn't. The books that I love are such a big part of my personality that it would be really sad to go back into my past and like completely destroy past me for liking everything that I used to love. So this feels correct. I could go within the tiers and like order them, but I'm not gonna do that. That's a video for another day. This is already probably longer than I thought it would be. And my voice, like if it wasn't shot before, you can't tell because I've been like coating my throat in water, but it is shot. It is we're not having a good time. I'm gonna go lay down. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed seeing my opinions apparently on everything that I've ever loved. This is quite the video in retrospect. If you like this video, you should drop an actual like. You should comment about all of your favorite books and also your takes on the books that I've roasted today. Unless you plan on roasting this top layer upon which don't talk to me or my son ever again. And if you're not already subscribed, you should do that. It's like really fun. I've heard to be a subscription holder for this channel. <laughs> It's a really good time. But that's everything. I'm gonna go into my cave where I edit this video and take doses of ibuprofen and then eventually NyQuil until I start to feel better. It's been real. It's been a blast. That's everything I have to say. Bye!